Okay, it's, a, it's beautiful outside, so I'm sure you guys want to get out there. It's time to bring this train on into the station here. So, um, as I said earlier, I'm Chris Bowling, and my job, number one, is I'm a general pediatrician in Northern Kentucky. Um, like I say, that's the way I always describe myself because that's my most important role. But I also do a lot of work in obesity. I'm current section chair for obesity with the American Academy of Pediatrics. And my mission in life is to make this doable for those of us who are in practice, who are pediatricians, NPs, PAs, um, people who are in, in practice dealing with this on a daily basis. So let's talk a little bit about um, what we've heard today and how you actually do bring this into practice. Because I think there's some very specific things that we've all seen today that really make it doable. Um, I love, love, love Steve's approach at how practical he makes um, the counseling and how we have to meet parents where they are. And I think that's a really important message when you go home and go back to your practices, that this is not one size fits all. It's about problem solving and it's about what's working for your particular patients. In your, in your packet, you've got some really great resources. I was so impressed to see you guys do have the flip chart in here. This is hot off the presses. Ashley and I have not even seen this yet. Um, this is the latest edition on the 5210 flip chart. Um, it has all sorts of resources in it in terms of billing, coding, a lot of the comorbidity management that Ashley went over. So please, please, please use this. There's been a lot of work, a lot of thought. This is the second iteration on it. Um, a really valuable resource for everyone. The second thing that you've got in there is actually this paper. And this is what I'm going to kind of go over with you. You saw some of the earlier algorithms. Well, there was a real need for us to try to simplify that at the American Academy of Pediatrics. Because if you remember how that looked when you first saw it this morning with all the arrows flying around in the boxes and yes and no and this way and that way, it really can get very confusing and overwhelming. So what this is, it is a boiled down version on two, sheets, two sides of one sheet of paper for you to think about how you might manage pediatric obesity in your office in a very practical way. Um, the whole goal of this is to make it practical for you in practice, and we'll go over it. The other thing that's in here from the um, state of Maine is um, tips for making the algorithm work in your office and tips for making this happen for you. Um, again, it's very dependent on what your practice is, what it looks like, how it's structured, what your parents, what your patients' needs are, um, but it's some really practical ideas on how to make it work for you. So um, I hope you'll all have a lot of questions too because there's some, um, a lot of different ways to approach this. So we know why obesity is a problem. P families and kids struggle to reduce caloric intake and increase physical activity, which leads to excess weight gain. We all know the things that we heard about today. It's excess screen time, it's low physical activity, it's unsafe neighborhoods, it's hectic schedules, it's all those things coming together to conspire against kids being at a healthy weight. And it's all really happened, amazingly, in the last 25 years. We had been at stable weight status for hundreds of years in this country. Um, and really, with the, everything kind of hitting together at the same time, increased portion size, increased sweet drinks, decreased activity, moving off the farm, all sorts of things caused us to kind of get in this predicament. Um, what we can do as providers is really work at that family provider interface to really help them. For those of you who've actually been participating in a lot of the patient-centered medical home efforts, um, do we have any practices who've gone for PCMH certification yet? I know our, my practice uses a lot of obesity work around this. It really is central when you do go for that certification and do go for patient-centered medical home in your practices. Um, for those of you who are familiar with it, obesity work really works toward that. It really fits the self-management model. Um, it's use of chronic care and thinking about obesity as a chronic care. It's about screening for comorbidities, like we said, and it's referral to other health services when needed. 
I want to stress that it's really important to have a cheerleader or a mascot in your office. And this is me as a mascot for Thomas More College, who just won the national, women's national championships two years in a row. But I'll pass on that. So, um, but it's important to have somebody in the office who really works sort of as your chief cheerleader on this effort. You've got to have somebody who's a little bit of a point person to kind of bring everybody along. And I assume that's all of you guys who are in this room. Um, it's important that you really identify for your patients what the challenges are. As Steve said, it's a joint, it's a joint effort in doing that. And you really want to help connect them to community resources um, and advocate for improvements in your community as well as helping them on a patient by patient basis. It's a big job, but we got to do it. So thinking about this in your office, and this is a, something we always struggle with because, you know, 10 years ago when I was doing this kind of work, everybody said, well, we really don't know what to tell people. We really don't know what to do. That has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years. We do know what to do. There are things that work. There are things that work better than other things, but we do know what to do. And I would say it's a much like treating patients with other chronic illnesses. You know, what's it like to treat, what would it be like if we treated a patient with obesity in our offices, similar to how we treat our patients with asthma? It's a pretty simple question to ask. Let's think about Amelia. She's an eight-year-old female who comes into your office for persistent asthma. You know what to do. You prescribe albuterol for her. You give her flow vent. You, do, um, you might do some sort of clinical scoring for her that gives you an idea of the severity of her problems. And you know what her comorbidities are. She's got allergic rhinitis. What does it look like if Amelia is obese? She comes in with class one obesity. Her plan of care is to reduce sugar-sweetened beverages to increase activity to three times a week with that's vigorous. Um, her control, we can describe it in a way that her BMI, where it's going, we know something about her drinking, we know something about her fruit and vegetable consumption, we know something about her bad habit of eating a pint of ice cream potentially. We know the milieu that she works in at, sco at school, that she has very limited gym class. Um, and we know some things about her physically that she, has some, she does not have shortness of breath or chest pain with activity. So for Amelia, she might not even see this as a problem because it's not affecting her life. We know something about her comorbidities. She also has allergic rhinitis, but she's also got snoring. So she might be showing us some comorbidities. On physical exam, obviously a patient with, a, with asthma, we're looking for certain things. We're looking at her allergic symptoms, we're listening to her lungs, and we might find certain things. If we do an obesity exam with her, we're looking for um, physical development, we're looking for signs of uh, liver or spleen enlargement potentially, we're looking for signs of early puberty, we're looking for dermatologic signs, so very similar. Our plan is gonna look similar as well. Just like a patient with asthma, we're going to have a very specific plan for albuterol with her. We're going to look at environmental triggers, trying to get rid of the 10 cats that live with her, trying to get her parents to quit smoking. We might even form an asthma action plan with her. And we're going to do a monitoring visit with her, follow her back in three months for an asthma check. What does it look like if we're managing her obesity? Very similar. It might be something like talking about how we're going to increase fruit and vegetable consumption for her. We're gonna talk about sugar-sweetened beverages, possibly, talk about her confidence in changing those things. We might discuss with her how to increase physical activity. We might address certain pitfalls and barriers, like parents and an uncle, who might be the saboteurs in the situation. Um, and then we're also gonna think back about monitoring her. We're not gonna turn the ship around in one visit. You know, we've said it a lot of times, we didn't get into this problem overnight, we're not gonna get out of it right away either. So a lot of times as providers, I think we have the message like, well, I tried it and it didn't work. Well, just like you wouldn't leave in a patient with asthma and say, ah, I tried it once, I tried one thing, it didn't work. Same philosophy with our patients with obesity. We might even walk away, she might even walk away with an asthma care plan that looks like something like this, or an obesity care plan that looks something like this. So a lot of similarities. We also might consider referral for her asthma if it's not under control, 
Are there other complicate conditions that are complicating management, like rhinitis or vocal cord dysfunction? We might also consider some other diagnostic tests to better manage her asthma. And so it goes with obesity. We might need to consider a referral if her BMI continues to increase. We're finding other conditions that are present or other diagnostic tests that we need to work up. So it really is very similar to other chronic diseases, and we need, to be getting, we need to be thinking about it in that way. It makes it a lot more easy to figure out and a lot more doable, in my mind, when we think about it as a chronic illness. So how do we put it all together with this new algorithm? Um, the new algorithm, um, we've talked about the 2007 guidelines a lot. And Ashley and I were discussing there actually are probably going to be some new ones coming out pretty soon that are going to have a little bit of updating. But this new algorithm does contain some of the new information and where we're probably going to go with some of these new recommendations. So there's some, there's some stuff that is in from the old guidelines, but also it's been updated with new information. It's focused around the well-child visit, and it continues on in planned follow-up visits. It's not a protocol. So and what do I mean by that? This is not a one-size-fits-all. If this child has obesity, you must do X, Y, or Z. As we know, that doesn't work with obesity. We have to really know and tailor this for our families. So it makes it a little confusing, but it's also something that makes it functional. It really focuses on a medical home, it's provider driven, so it's driven by us. Um, it's expert informed and it relies on existing guidelines with a lot of new research and a lot of new consensus statements that are involved in it. So what are the take home messages from this algorithm? And we're gonna go over them a little bit more. Assessment is a critical piece of the puzzle as we've been saying all day. The assessment is doable in the primary care setting the treatment is described to be flexible and based on your needs and your interest and your time to do things. Um, children who are greater than the, you've heard this a few times today too, that children who have a BMI greater than the 85th percentile may be sick and they may need special considerations with regards to lab values, physical exam, history, et cetera. So there's a look at it both sides of the paper. Okay, so let's drill into it a little bit. So the first line on it is really assessing behaviors. And that's a lot of what things that we've talked about. You know, assessment is about child growth. It's a, something we really are good at as pediatric medical providers. Um, overweight and obesity need to be identified because as we know, early intervention is very important. Some of these kids are actually already sick um, they have a lot of predisposing factors like poor fruit and vegetable consumption, excessive screen time, high sugar consumption. Um, and it's important in an office to think about who's doing this assessment, what are you assessing, and how you're going to do it. You know, I talk with pediatricians all the time, and I think for those of us who know Bright Futures, which is, you know, the AAP guidelines on what you should be doing in a checkup, you could spend four hours um, on each checkup doing bright futures. You, there's just too much. And so it's important to figure out that this is not everything done at once, and this is done in a way like by using the Healthy Habits Survey, where you can actually get a lot of this stuff done, and it's a constructive discussion with the family rather than a checklist. You can also involve other people in your office in doing big pieces of this as well. Um, I, as I said, I, I'm a believer in uh, the Healthy Habits Questionnaire. And as I said, what we do with ours is we've gone through so many different iterations of this. My partners love it. Page, parents come to expect it. Um, we put a little signature down at the bottom. So then after they pick which behavior they want to do, I sign it and I hand it back to them. And all I record in the chart, I don't make a photocopy of this or anything else. I just record in the chart, Healthy Habits Survey, want to work on plan X, you know, want to work on screen time. Um, so we have it just as a point and click. So it's very quickly entered into the chart. Um, and like I said, we don't keep this because the, the, the beauty of this is hopefully it goes back and gets stuck on the refrigerator at home and as a reminder for the kids. And as Steve 
very eloquently mentioned, we're talking about 5210 behaviors. These are good for normal weight, underweight, overweight kids all together. These are good for parents. These are good for all of us sitting in the room to be doing 5210 behaviors. Um, so in our office, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, we have our 5210 posters sitting above um, above, uh, this is Mandy and Christy at our front desk. Um, I had, we're really, we were trying to really push out 5210 uh, across, you know, all the different sectors. And you know how fathers can be in the office. Sometimes they are generally smart Alex when they come into the office. So Mandy was sitting right here and um, a father came in and he said, 5210, I know what that means. Eat five fruit or vegetable servings, get less than two hours of screen time, one woman and no drinking. <laughs> so, close, but at least you're paying attention. So um, that's part of our routine stuff. And then after that, um, I want to say one little comment in here. We have been screaming BMI, 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 BMI all day long. I, you know, it's really important to not focus exclusively on BMI. It's a way for us to talk about it, it's the vernacular we use, it's the way we use, as, a, as you've heard this a few times too, it's a clinical indicator, but it's a very valid comment. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger has, a, has an obese BMI, but he's all muscle. You know, and you'll hear that comment a lot too. In kids, it, it's not perfect. You'll also find that area with, when, when um, Stephanie was talking about the BMI rebound, you'll find a child at five who is in the obese range, who has a BMI percentile of like 96%. If you take that same child at the same height, same weight, but make them eight, they're in the normal weight range. So you'll get a lot of kids, it's really hard to look at them, they just look older. They don't really look any different. They just look like an older child in a lot of circumstances. So it, it's not perfect. BMI has all sorts of limitations. But it's the way we talk. It's imperfect. Are we going to have better assessments down the line? Absolutely we are. But is this something that we can deal with now and something that can help us now? Absolutely it can. So what we do generally with it is we're categorizing kids into three categories, in either in the healthy weight range, the overweight range, or the obese range. And as Steve also mentioned, you know, the, this term is going to show up on their explanation of benefits. I want me describing what that means rather than an insurance, them getting an insurance paper and say, Dr. Bowling just told me my child is obese. So it, it, it forces us to have that discussion. It's uncomfortable, no question, but it's an, it's an important discussion to have with your, with your medical provider, in my opinion. Um, you know, in primary care, we're, we're expected to be good at measuring growth, and we are good at it. I mean, we're really the ones who are able to measure kids appropriately. Um, you know, it, we standardize pra practices. We know how to chart kids on their BMI chart. We also know how to chart them on the WHO charts when they're under age two. Um, and we're, it's also our expectations to be able to identify and note concerns whether they're overweight or not gaining appropriately. It's just something we do. We're good at it. This is, this is part of what we've always done with growth and talking about with growth. It's just expanding that role a little bit as a pediatrician. As I said, BMI is really imperfect. It is not the be all end all. And anybody who says it is clearly doesn't know exactly what it is. Um, it's important to think about how you're using the terms. I think it's important to put terms like overweight and obese in context for our patients. You can't just drop it on them. It's gonna be met with a lot of anxiety, as we all know. Um, and it's also important to think about weight bias in your office. You know, I, um, I, I'm in this because I have a personal weight loss story. It's, it's a chronic disease for me. I've always had to manage it. I got bullied when I was younger. It's just part of who I am. And I know when people are, you know, when people are show, demonstrating some weight bias. You know, it comes down to even simple things like, I don't say an obese child, or I try not to say an obese child. I try to say a child with obesity, or a patient with obesity. Obesity is a disease. And it, obesity doesn't define who that person is. 
obesity is part of what they're struggling with. So it's important to kind of think about patient first language, but it's also important to really make sure in your office that you're doing things that don't promote weight bias, that your chairs are big enough, that your office doors are big enough, that you might have um, toilets that are floor mounted and not wall mounted if they don't support heavy people. So it's important to really think about those kinds of structures in your office and to really be in tune with that. Um, I had, um, I do a lot of work with preschools and childcare facilities as part of our Success by Six program. And I had a, um, I mean, you've, I love weight management because it's really poignant. It's really, it, you really get people exposed. They really bear their souls to you. And it's really powerful. You have some really powerful moments. I was talking with a childcare provider and she, we were talking about strategies for getting kids in childcare to have better eating habits. And this very overweight um, uh, uh, childcare provider said to me, she said, I feel like an absolute hypocrite telling my kids that they can't have this and they need to try fruits and vegetables. For goodness sake, look at me. And she was tearing up. And you know, one of the things that I think is important that we tried to get back to cross to her was, you know what, if you're someone who struggles with weight, the last person you want telling you what to do is someone who obviously does not struggle with weight. Um, you know, connecting with that person and kind of being in there together with them, hey, look, we're all trying, we're all struggling, is a really powerful message. So, you know, the message that we're all in this together, I think is a really important one. Um, so, you know, we talk about prevention counseling, we talk about doing the weight classification, and then you drill in. And we, on, the, on your algorithm, you'll kind of see these are, this is not anything, it's things we've already gone over, so nothing brand new here. Um, you do routine care, you do good prevention, you do, um, for, um, you really just do, you're doing your good stuff, you're talking about 5210, they're doing the healthy risk, a healthy habits assessment, you're really looking at them, but doing some good prevention counseling with your healthy weight kids. And then, before we leap into the other ones, thinking ahead on these next kids, they could be sick, we've said that a few times today, so just be prepared, these kids that are greater than the 95th, 85th percentile even, could have some higher risk for comorbidities. You're gonna, you may need to fine tune your assessment, as we mentioned, by family history, <coughs> review of systems, physical exam, um, and those are all laid out. So, you know, Ashley kind of went over a lot of those things. Those are all laid out in here. Um, if you look down at some of your obesity-related conditions in the, in the red box down at the bottom. Um, so we're, kinda, we're gonna go over a few of these. This family history, if you're going quickly on these things, is basically you're asking about obesity, type two diabetes, hypertension, lipid abnormalities, and heart disease. Um, your physical exam, you're looking for a lot of the things we mentioned. Um, you know, everything from things that Ashley and I never really see, which is papilledema due to pseudotumor cerebri, but we're scared to death of it, honestly. Um, but you're looking for all these other things as well. You're looking for um, asthma, and just like Ashley mentioned, we're looking for short stature, short stature, which might be a sign of hypothyroidism, we're looking for signs of polycystic ovary disease. We're looking for Blount's disease, which, how many people have heard of Blount's disease before today? Anybody heard of it before today? Because <laughs> that's one, it's, that was one that was brand new to me when I started doing obesity work 12, 15 years ago. I was like, wow, kids are so, there are some kids that are so heavy that get bowing of the tibias. It's really, but anyway, these are things that you need to be looking for, specific things on physical exam. Um, so it's really important that, I, that we mention when you, if you have kids that are in this 85th to 94th percentile, that your clinical judgment on what you do next really fits in. You know, where is this family ready? What are the underlying risk factors for them? So in this 85th to 94th percentile, the overweight range, they're getting all the routine care that the healthy weight kids are getting. Um, and then we do a little bit more specific review in this area to see if we need to do anything else with them. So if you notice like the yellow thing, we kind of do this extra assessment and then they might get pushed over into this category with lab evaluation. 
um, lab evaluation. Um, so either they're coming at this from the red side of the screen, or let me back up one here. So they're either coming at this red box here because they've come down the yellow and they've got risk factors to come into it, or they're coming straight down the red box into it, okay? So in this lab evaluation area, and we're not saying that you have to absolutely get labs on everybody greater than 95th percentile. It's recommended, but you're gonna have parents that don't wanna do this. Um, but what you're doing is you're basically doing screening. And we said, it's not, you might not be necessarily starting them on statins and things that you're not comfortable with, but it's an important piece in motivation. A lot of times I'll get the question back like, okay, so you did these lab values and they all came back normal and now the family's gonna say, everything's fine, I don't have to worry about this weight issue. I don't know, that's not what happens in my experience. In my experience, it still is a really good discussion. A lot of times what we get is the, phew, I didn't, we don't have any of these things yet. And it's an opportunity to say, you know what? We've got an opportunity. I was worried enough to get these things done. They know you were worried enough to get these lab, labs done. And now they're kind of going like, okay, we've got a chance to head this off at the pass. So I would say that's a more likely response. There are definitely people who are gonna say, ah, manana, now that I'm fine. But in general, most people are interested in staying healthy. Um, I'd like to propose one other thing. Um, Ashley and I participated in a, um, a, a listserv that went around and around and around and around on what labs you should order and should they be fasting and they, should they be this, should they be that, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it just went on and on and on. It was people from one coast to the other and nobody had the same thing. Ashley and I tend to come from places where endocrinology is very strong and we are big on getting a fasting insulin level and you when i said that you thought i thought i was just like oh my gosh what is that crazy man in cincinnati suggesting um but um uh it, it, you're going to see a bottom line is you're going to see a lot of variation one very pragmatic approach and this is bob siegel's thing from the center for better health and nutrition in cincinnati is he even says you know get a not you if you can't get a fasting one get a non-fasting one Get a glucose, a hemoglobin, which is effective, but still interpretable if it's non-fasting. Get a hemoglobin A1C, that's not affected. Our lipid panel, we actually do that at point of care. We actually do that in the office with one of the more rapid tests. It's not perfect, it's not, it's not a fasting lipid, but it's, it can give you some good information if you have a low HDL or if you have sky high triglycerides. Um, an, a, an ALT and an AST are not affected by by fasting either. So I, I kind of say that this is Midwestern pragmatism. You know, it's like, it's, it's not necessarily, as Steve said, it's not the gold standard, but sometimes the enemy of good is perfect, as they say. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to give you a, an approach that might work, and people land all over the place. This is what we mean by clinical judgment. You gotta do what works for your situation with your patients, and the barriers that they're facing. Um, Obesity-related conditions, you know, obviously those are things that need to be worked up and need to be referred on. Um, the key points with management and treatment before we launch into the set, uh, backside of this page is, as we said today, wait a second, we're like a broken record, aren't we? So, so not every patient is ready. Fear tactics don't work, don't even try them. There are no quick fixes. Frequent visits over time really work. And all you gotta do is do it a few times. Dive in and do it, and you'll come up with some of the most amazing stories you'll ever encounter. I could stand up here all day long and tell you about Clay and Madison and a host of patients who are just transformed because they're their, their pediatric office took interest in them and helped them. Um, small behavior changes have profound effects. For some of these kids, they're making one critical mistake. They're drinking too much soda, or they're eating too late at night, or they're not getting sleep, or they're not eating breakfast. So for some kids, it is a really small change, can have a huge impact. Um, motivational interviewing really works. Um, and if you guys are interested in more, I mean, I, 
I, I can't say enough. That's like a great, a great project if you guys are looking for like to get more, uh, more up and running with it. Um, and the stages um, um, that follow are just a guide. I'll tell you where, we, where my practice sort of shakes out on this one. Um, Next Steps, which um, Ashley mentioned earlier, is a great little resource um, if you're kind of diving in. I've kind of gotten to the point with my goal sheet, which looks very similar to Steve and Ashley's, um, but it is, um, it's a great one. If it is, as Ashley mentioned, it's sort of a flip chart. It's got 18 different goals that you can sit there and work with a patient on. It's, it's great. So what does the backside look like? It really goes through the four stages of treatment. I would say my practice is a two plus practice. We're right here. We obviously do not have on-site gastroenterology and on, even on-site dietitians. We've got some on-site other support, which I can go into if you really want to know it. It's kind of boring. But, um, but we're really kind of a stage two plus in my pediatric office. Um, so what does that mean? So stage one prevention plus is like kind of what everybody's doing. You're trying to identify, you're trying to tailor a message, you're trying to talk a little bit more, you've got some more resources to be talking with those kids who you find at risk. What's stage two? Stage two, again, structured weight management. So when we brought this up in my office, I'm gonna skip ahead one real quick here. So we did state, we have, like I said, we have sort of this stage three or stage two plus thing in my office. Where we, we have it, it's called basic training, it's a little more military than I wanted it to be called, but my partners outvoted me. So we have basic training, and I, one of my nurse practitioners, one of my physician assistants, we do this in the office with scheduled visits. So we bring kids back in. It's a very specific thing. It's got a name. It's got a brochure. It's got a very specific way that my partners refer into it. But my partners all said, you know what? I don't want to necessarily give these patients up. I want to do this on my own with a patient who I've taken care of forever. Um, I, um, it, you know, it, it really, you, you develop those relationships. And in my practice, my partners, like I say, they just don't want to turn them over. And they say, you know what? I think if I can have a few structured visits with them, it's going to be a lot more effective than turning them over to you, Chris, and you haven't seen them for this issue. I've been talking with them. I've been talking with them about their running career for years. I really think I can make some inroads with them. And so that's what structured weight management is. It's bringing kids back, you know, identifying things, using some basic motivational interviewing that all my partners know now, um, using some materials that I've helped provide them with on some basic goal setting, but they bring them back on their schedule and they bring them back to see them as their primary care doc, just like you would if they had ADHD or they had asthma or they had diabetes. It's a chronic disease. So my, page, my, my partners like to bring back their patients and I really view that as stage two structured management. Um, something else I was gonna mention about that, I'll probably think of it. Anyway, any questions on how we structure that at all? Pretty slick, actually. Oh, I know what I was going to say. You know, there's a lot of places where if you have a structured weight management program, I, I, some of the traps that you fall into, you hear a lot of people say like, oh, I want to do this on Wednesday afternoons. That's when I'm going to have my weight management visits. Well, if that's the only day that that child has soccer practice, I don't want them missing soccer practice. So the way we do our weight management ones, we have them scattered out through the course of the day. They're scattered in and amongst our other visits. Um, so an initial visit, we'll code for that as a 99215 visit for those of you who do coding. Um, subsequent visits are 99214 visits. Um, we use comorbidities that we've screened for with the labs and we build those back in in the course of the day. When my partners are doing visits, I'm, I'm telling them, you're doing counseling, you're doing 20 minutes, you are not, this is not a quick, oh, let me check your ear, because there may be tears involved, there may be meal planning involved, there may be looking at food logs involved. This is at least a 20 minute visit. You need to bill appropriately for it, okay? Okay, and then comes stage four. So what is stage four? We didn't mention a whole lot about stage four other than to say that 
Ashley and Steve run a stage four program, and I refer to the one at Children's in Cincinnati quite a bit. Um, but you know, these are places that have a full complement of subspecialty services. These are places that have bariatric surgeons, that have um, uh, sur uh, gastroenterologists who deal with uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. These are places that have full-fledged um, um, pulmonologists who deal with this. So they've got the full complement, and they also have, in a lot of places, bariatric surgery options. Um, you know, I think as providers, we all get, you know, you will get, and I, I'm sure many of you have had this situation of someone coming in and saying, this patient is 400 pounds and they need help from you this afternoon. Like, you know, it, this is not going to be undone in a 15, 20 minute visit. These patients need a lot of help, and I'm not saying you don't help them, but your, your role may be to get them on to a place where they can really be helped appropriately. Um, because it's going to be really, really difficult to deal with those kinds of issues in a primary care setting. Um, but the other kids leading up to it, absolutely, we need to be dealing with. Um, some of the things we mentioned, you know, I, I, I said I was going to say, said to Ashley, I was going to mention something about bariatric surgery. You know, in Kentucky, we have a lot of patients who fit that category. Um, I work a lot with the, bari with the teen weight loss program at, at Children's, and I can't tell you how many patients we have that come from our state. We just, we have a really, really hard time with it. And um, I think it's important to get those kids where they need to get. Um, you know, there's certainly age parameters around it. I'd be happy to talk with anybody about that. There are appropriate and inappropriate ways of doing this. But a lot of those kids are not going to get relief from significant comorbidities until they get higher level referral. Um, I just kind of threw these in here. Um, I would encourage you to go to the kyaap.org site and look at the CACO posts. That's the Kentucky Action for Childhood Obesity. Um, if you're referring for some of these tertiary centers, um, I threw up, threw up on the slide here Bob Siegel's number with this, for the Center for Better Health and Nutrition. Um, and also, she, uh, Stephanie mentioned Aurelia this morning. Aurelia is a wonderful person. She runs the high BMI clinic. The downside with the high BMI clinic is they don't have a lot of therapy there. It's mostly just evaluation and assessment and then refer back to the communities. Um, uh, Children's is coming out, and they bring actually out um, some hyperlipidemia folks to Maysville um, on a monthly basis now, so about an hour away at least. So, um, but I also am very hopeful, and my fingers are crossed, that Tim is going to be successful in getting St. Clair to be a regional center for this. Um, I think it's a really, you know, a, a, this is where the obesity crisis is taking place on the, on the front lines. And we need leaders like St. Clair, and the, which, which was in the Chickasaw Nation, you know, in Oklahoma, and Trover Clinic in Madisonville, for those of fellow Kentuckians know where that is. Um, it's really going to take places like those that are really going to make a difference in this. And I'm thrilled that you guys have a pediatric sleep lab. That's great. It's not pediatric. It's, it, they do pediatrics, but it's a general. That counts. <laughs> that counts. I'll take it. I'll take it. So, you know, and it's, and we need, you know, I just, I, I think it's a really, when I tell people that like, okay, St. Clair's is thinking about doing something like, this is like groundbreaking. So, um, and, and really exciting. So I, you know, you guys get a gold star. That's all I got to say. Um, so what can be done in a well child visit? Assessment can be done. You can begin the conversation. You can set the stage. You can gauge the patient and family interest, and you can arrange for follow-up. Are labs necessary? Is referral necessary? Does the patient and family really want to keep going? Did you notice I didn't say start weight management? Because you can't do that on a well visit. I mean, you can do these things, but you can't really get down into the weeds yet. You got to bring them back. It's just, there's too much pressure on a well child visit. For those of you out there with me who, you know, have 15 minutes on a good day for a well visit, you're not going to be able to address a huge number of things on your well child visit. You can get the ball rolling, 
you can get your assessment going, but you have to be able to build out this next phase if you really want to make a difference. I shouldn't say that. You can make a difference, but you, 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 know, you know what I mean. Stage two and three really requires more intervention. What are the take-home messages? Assessment is a critical piece of the puzzle. It's doable in a primary care setting. Kids greater than the 85th may be sick and might need special consideration to determine if they're ill from lab tests and additional workup um, from family history and physical exam. Um, but it can be done. Um, so, you know, and the latest thing I would say is it really is up to you guys. Um, you should not feel guilty. I'm not about guilt with my patients. I'm not about guilt with other providers. You need to be doing this based on what you have capacity for. If this is something that turns you on and you find that I'm ready to make a difference, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of ways that you can. By the same token, if you're like, you know what? I can do a good job at assessment and prevention. God bless you. That's enough. We need people doing that at the very least. So it's not, it's, there's no guilt if you can't dive in and say, you know what, I am too busy to do X, Y, or Z. It's just like going on a diet for your patients or going to resolving to get healthy. You have to do it on your own terms and you have to do it in a way that works for you. So with that, I'd like to ask and see if anybody has any questions about that. Yes, Dreema. Oh, great question. So I will, so here's the way a typical referral goes to base, to like to our basic training program. So like our, my providers all know how to do the initial labs. So they'll like at a checkup, they'll identify a patient. Let's say, you know, Dr. Bowling's got this program. Would you be interested? And if they say yes, then they get the labs done. The labs come to me and that patient will get scheduled for a 30 minute visit with me usually at the end of my morning or at the end of the day in case it runs long. Um, and so it's a 30 minute visit. And like I say, I'll bill for 99215. Subsequent visits are typically 20 minutes long. Um, and I have, a, uh, I have a little slide that shows you exactly how I do it. it it's basically, it, it's a, I stole it from John Fanberg, who's one of the guys from Maine. But basically it's like, you know, your assessment is like for five or six minutes and then you have a 30 second to 60 second physical exam. And then the rest is about goal setting and, and, and problem solving. So 30 and 20 is what I do when I'm up and running. Starting off, give yourself 45 and 30 I mean, as you're kind of learning it. Because at first you're gonna go like, okay, now what can I give them for this goal? And so like what you'll find is you'll find like, um, like for me in our office, like if they pick our one hour physical activity goal, I would talk a little bit about what that means because physical activity is really different for different people and it's got to work for them. So like if they're, if they're a really outdoor kid and it's an appropriate age, I have like a list of parks and hiking trails around, their, around our practice. But you know, that's not right for everybody. So you gotta really, it takes a while to get all those materials. But you get better at it. You kind of like know where to, where to what, and you let them sort of guide you. Yes. What's your biggest challenge? With with what? With. Pick a topic. What is your biggest challenge in your Um, getting families motivated. You know, we um, getting them over. It still is about getting them to have that aha moment. And again, you don't get there by shaming, and you don't get there by wanting them to get there on your schedule, you just sort of sit back and wait. You know, you, you plant the seed and it's amazing what happens. Once they know you're a safe person to talk with, they come back. I, 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 I could name 30 patients who I'd say they are never gonna do anything. And then two years later, here they are. I have one family that we've had like three false starts and then they, then they got it. But plant, the seed. plant the seed and wait. Yes. Do you meet with the family or with the team and then the family? 
awesome question. So this kind of gets back. I'd love to get Steve and Ashley's chime in on this one too. So like when we're talking, when I'm, when I'm saying kids under, I always am trying to involve the kids as much as I can. So I think it goes without saying as much as you can involve them, you involve them. But really like when you're using motivational interviewing, if it's under, if they're under age six, you're really doing motivational interviewing with the family. If they're over age 11, you're really doing, a, despite what the parents think, you're really doing motivational interviewing with the kids because at 11, they're making 99% of the choices. Between six and 11, I think it's sort of a hybrid. It's a little bit of, you know, because once they get to school, they're making choices at friends and they're able to access things. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, I, I would agree. Um, so a lot of times, so in our clinic, we've got a pediatrician, we have psychology. And so for adolescents, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll spend a little bit of time um, with them together, but then I'll kick, yep. I'll, I'll kick everyone else but, out mm -hmm. but the adolescent. Um, the other thing that happens in our clinic is we get lots of sibling groups. Um, and, you know, and again, families have hectic lives, and so they're not bringing kids individually. They're going to bring them together. Um, and so even that's the other thing is that then you run into the issue of, you know, all this is about intrinsic motivation and, you know, individual. So if you're talking to two siblings, you get this generalization of, and you get nowhere. So the same thing, we end up having to separate siblings mm -hmm. so you can really kind of figure out what's going on. Because what's going on for, you know, even if they're twins, you know, they're, they're very much different. So we have to separate them out. Well, yeah, your, your comment, too, about, you know, we were talking about, like, the, the, the old stages of change thing, how it's like it's kind of nice to talk about, but in practical fact, people are flipping back and forth. They're flipping back. You know, twins are, like, in different spots at, different, at the same time and on different behaviors. I mean, you know, like, you've got, like, you've got, like, four activity behaviors and eight eating behaviors, and they're all in different stages of change. They're all all over the place. So it's a little bit of both. So. so anyway, so you guys are off to a great start. So thank you for all your attention. This has been a long day. This has been drinking from the fire hose, I know. <laughs> so, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Just a couple of more minutes and then we'll let you get out of here. My name's Tom Lewis. I'm executive director of the St. Clair Foundation and uh, chair of the Gateway Wellness Coalition, which was uh, one of the, the sponsors that coordinated this event. First of all, thank you. Uh, we know this has been an incredibly long, very full day, um, full bellies as much as mine's probably. Uh, but thank you for hanging in with us and, and we hope that it's been worth your while. Uh, it's certainly been worth ours uh, seeing this many people here. Um, also want to extend another thank you to our presenters, Drs. Rose, Whedon, Gillespie, and Bowling. We do have some gifts uh, for each of them. Uh, each will go away with a bottle of Kentucky's official beverage. Um, we have three different ones for them. The three that are still here to choose from, we'll let them duke that out, decide which one each one will, will get. Uh, Dr. Rose already left with the one of the highest proof. Sorry about that. Uh, but we do have three nice bottles remaining for you. Um, want to thank our planning team. If you're part of the, the planning team that helped put this event together, if you don't mind just standing up and letting us recognize you. I don't see them out here, but also want to thank our caterers for all of the wonderful food that was prepared from breakfast all the way through, uh, through dinner tonight. So thanks to them as well. Um, some next steps. Uh, we don't want this to just to be one of those events where you come and say, oh, that was nice, and you go back to doing what you were doing exactly the same way. Uh, this is intended to set the stage for some positive change, uh, and we want to accomplish that together as much as we possibly can. We know that collaboration is crucial, especially when we work in a, a community the, the size of, of Moorhead and, and, and Northeastern Kentucky. It's going to take a team effort uh, to make uh, some positive change, and we hope that this, this conference can be the start of some of that. Um, the sessions were videoed today. Thank our videographer for that. Um, we will post the videos as well as the visuals uh, online. Uh, 
We don't want this to be the type of thing where you can only benefit from these if you were here today. Uh, we, we wanted this to be free for a reason. Uh, we want this to be something that can be shared as much as possible. So if you have colleagues who you think would be interested in all or part of what was uh, covered today, uh, just let them know that this will be available very soon online and we'll, we'll get the information out to you as, as to how you can uh, access that. Um, plenty of ideas, plenty of possibilities. And as Dr. Bowling said, we want you to implement some or all of what was discussed today. Uh, we have some, some dreams, some hopes, some ideas uh, collectively that we're looking at, including the possibility of an interdisciplinary pediatric obesity clinic here in Moorhead in Northeastern Kentucky. Uh, we're not there yet, but hopefully this is the start to get us to that point eventually. Um, the Gateway Wellness Coalition, and I don't wanna talk a lot about it because uh, you've heard so much information already today, but it's really just a partnership of different organizations here in the area trying to make a positive difference to address the key uh, health concerns that we face, nutrition, and obesity, physical activity is one of those, those major kind of umbrella issues that we're addressing. Uh, some of the ways we're already doing that, there's a program called Walking for Wellness, uh, where we encourage elementary school-aged kids, predominantly fourth graders, uh, to think about how much they're walking, how physically active are they. And we take about a six to eight week stretch out of the school year where they, they use pedometers and actually journal the number of steps they take each day. Uh, and hopefully over the course of that six week to two month period, they become more aware. I need to be more physically active. So that's one thing we're doing. Another is the Go Noodle Project. It's an online uh, web-based uh, series of what's called Brain Breaks, where teachers can access Go Noodle during the day, just three to five minute activities. The kids get up by their desks, move around, do some fun things, just get physically active. Uh, that has been, since we started this less than a year ago, has been used by 40% of the classrooms in the elementary schools in St. Clair Service Region. To get 40% of the teachers anywhere to agree on something <laughs> is a virtual miracle. So Go Noodle has already been a big uh, hit. Uh, we have already received grant funding for year two of that project. So um, excited about what that can, can accomplish. Uh, this conference, uh, hopefully, is, is something that's going to pay big dividends. And then um, we have some ideas on the horizon that we're looking at. Uh, one that uh, is in the very early stages. We haven't even had uh, a great deal of discussion about it. It's the, uh, the, the model called pharmacy, pharmacy with an F, uh, where we hope to develop a, a system where uh, physicians can prescribe produce, uh, locally grown produce and then we hope to set up a token system with our local farmers markets where patients get those tokens as prescribed can take them to the farmers market and get fresh fruits and vegetables grown locally. Uh, so that's just another idea that we're trying to get off the ground through the, the coalition. So always looking for other wonderful ideas. If you have any, we would love to hear them and we'll do everything we can to, to make them reality. So with that, uh, if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you so much for being here. Feel free to hang around if you want to talk, network a little bit more. If you need to get home, totally understand, but thank you for being here today.